there is no God. So how can I consider myself a God? The crisis of organized religion in the West and the numberless ways in which religious morality has actually managed to fall well below the human average has always led some anxious seekers to pursue a softer solution east of Suez. Indeed, I once joined these potential adepts and acolytes, donning orange garb and attending the ashram of a celebrated guru in Pune in the lovely hills above Bombay. I adopted this sannyas mode in order to help make a documentary film for the BBC, so you may well question my objectivity if you wish, but the BBC at that time did have a standard of fairness and my mandate was to absorb as much as I could. One of these days, having in the course of my life been an Anglican, educated at a Methodist school, converted by marriage to Greek Orthodoxy, recognized as an incarnation by the followers of Sai Baba, and remarried by a rabbi, I shall be able to try and update William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. The guru in question was named Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Bhagwan simply means God or Godly, and Sri means Holy. He was a man with huge soulful eyes and a bewitching smile, and a natural if somewhat dirty sense of humor. His sibilant voice, usually deployed through a low-volume microphone at early morning darshan, possessed a faintly hypnotic quality. This was of some use in alleviating the equally hypnotic platitudinousness of his discourses. There was more emphasis on love in its eternal sense, and certainly there was more emphasis on sex in its immediate sense, but on the whole, the instruction was innocuous. Or it would have been, if not for a sign at the entrance to the Bhagwan's preaching tent. This little sign never failed to irritate me. It read... Shoes and minds must be left at the gate. There was a pile of shoes and saddles next to it, and in my transcendent condition I could almost picture a heap of abandoned and empty mentalities to round out this literally mindless little motto. I even attempted a brief parody of a Zen koan. What is the reflection of a mind discarded? For the blissed-out visitor or tourist, the ashram presented the outward aspect of a fine spiritual resort, where one could burble about the beyond in an exotic and luxurious setting. But within its holy precincts, as I soon discovered, there was a more sinister principle at work. Many damaged and distraught personalities came to Pune, seeking advice and counsel. Several of them were well off. The clients or pilgrims included a distant member of the British royal family, and were at first urged, as with so many faiths, to part with all their material possessions. Proof of the efficacy of this advice could be seen in the fleet of Rolls-Royce motor cars maintained by the Bhagwan, and deemed to be the largest such collection in the world. After this relatively brisk fleecing, initiates were transferred into group sessions where the really nasty business began. Wolfgang Dobrovolny's film, Ashram, shot in secret by a former devotee and adapted for my documentary, shows the playful term Kundalini in a fresh light. In a representative scene, a young woman is stripped naked and surrounded by men who bark at her, drawing attention to all her physical and psychic shortcomings, until she's abject with tears and apologies. At this point, she is hugged and embraced and comforted and told that she now has a family. Sobbing with masochistic relief, she humbly enters the tribe. It was not absolutely clear what she had to do in order to be given her clothes back, but I did hear some believable and ugly testimony on this point. In other sessions involving men, things were rough enough for bones to be broken and lives lost. The German princeling of the House of Windsor was never seen again, and his body was briskly cremated without the tedium of an autopsy. I had been told in respectful and awed tones that the Bhagwan's body has some allergies. And not long after my sojourn, he fled the ashram and then apparently decided that he had no further use for his earthly frame. What happened to the Rolls-Royce collection I never found out, but his acolytes received some kind of message to reconvene in the small town of Antelope, Oregon, in the early months of 1983, and this they did, though now less committed to the Pacific and laid-back style. The local inhabitants were disconcerted to find an armed compound being erected in their neighborhood, with unsmiling orange guard security forces. An attempt to create space for the new ashram was apparently made. In a bizarre episode, food poisoning matter was found to have been spread over the produce in an antelope supermarket. Eventually, the commune broke up and dispersed amid serial recriminations, and I have occasionally run into empty-eyed refugees from the Bhagwan's long and misleading tuition. He himself has been reincarnated as Osho, in whose honor a glossy but stupid magazine was being produced until a few years ago. Possibly a remnant of his following still survives. I would say that the people of Antelope, Oregon, Miss being as famous as Jonestown by a fairly narrow margin. God is the greatest lie invented by man. It is a simple psychological projection.